promises of God all the time because they discipline me to remember who I am in him this morning John 7 37 if anyone thirsts this is Jesus if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scriptures have said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water out of us will flow living water. Jesus says that he is the bread of life, that he is our living water, that we will come to him and out of us will move him. He will move through our hearts. Oh man, he comes where he's wanted. He comes where he's wanted. Let us cultivate our oh, desire. Lord Jesus, we see your face. We see what you've done. We know we can put our faith in you. Because great is thy faithfulness.
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, a faithful promise in. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart
Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give peace. Sing that with me.
know that when we put out that prayer, Lord, when we pray in your name, we can be confident that it is already done, Lord Jesus. So we pray that blessing over our families, over our children, Lord God. We come to you in your mighty, powerful name. In all things, Jesus, we love you so much. Amen. And you may be seated. Amen. Well, is anybody glad they came to church today? Glad to be in church today. Thank you, team, for leading us so well. Welcome to Eagle. This is your first time here. We're especially glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, welcome. If you have a Bible with you, open it up to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're in this series on the book of Nehemiah. Online folks, your host will direct you accordingly. Students, middle schoolers, you're off to the loft. Have a great morning up there. Well, does anybody remember the time that we existed without one of these in our pockets? I, I grew up, students, you know, I, hang with me here. I grew up in an era where we had a cord attached to the phone. Anybody with me in this? Students, this is how it worked. Like when I wanted to have those long, unending, love-filled conversations with my beautiful girlfriend, Kendra, our high, my high school sweetheart, when I wanted to talk to her and share my deepest, intimate feelings with her, that conversation had to occur within about six feet of the kitchen phone, because that's all mom and dad, that's the length of the cord. They're like, yeah, all your convos are going to have about six feet of this kitchen right here. So what I did is I took the cord and I stretched it underneath the basement door, and I'd sit on the basement steps. Honey, did you know that's where my heart was drawn to you? <laughs> on the basement steps, six feet from the kitchen phone. This device came out in 2007. Now with it came a whole host of things. Those of you in the insurance industry, here's what you had no idea. You had no idea how much this little device was going to change your world. Because you didn't have a category for what was going to occur in vehicles with this device. You didn't have the term that's become just standard vocabulary now, distracted driving. Do you remember that? When that first came out, I know the insurance industry had to figure out what are we going to call all these claims that are showing up on our desk for all the people that are distracted with these devices while they're driving and running into things. And then these really encouraging signs started showing up around our country, right? I mean, isn't that like super encouraging? You're driving along a talk, text, crash, like, oh, thank you so much for that. But all these came up because, right, there was a reality that Drivers got distracted with this device. Well, it's gone one step further than that now, that there's a new term, there's kind of a, as we carry these devices slash idols slash devices around, that now there's a term called distracted walking. Have you heard about this? So walkers are now infiltrated with this device. And the walking issue and accidents with walking, I did a little research on this, 52% of all distracted walking incidents happen with cell phones at home. <laughs> Think about that. Whole nother topic, I guess, on that one. 54% of those accidents distracted with a phone in their hand were under the age of 40. 68% of all injuries distracted walking are women. Now listen, I can't say anything helpful right now after that. I'm just going to let that be. 68% ladies. So I thought we just maybe need to glance at just a few examples of what's now become an epidemic in our culture today. It's called distracted walking. Take a look. Oh, <laughs> 
I love how the two young people are just standing there going, what is that? They're on their phones. I think we need new billboards, right? Instead of just like, right? It needs to be like the walk, text, crash kind of billboards need to go out. Johan Hari wrote a new book. It's called Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. I highly commend it to you. It's an excellent read. I just had a hard time focusing and paying attention while I was reading it. But nonetheless, I commend it to you on this topic. In the book itself, he uh, interviews several different people that are kind of industry experts in this whole idea of what's happening to the attention span and the ability for people to focus these days. And he interviews Dr. James Williams, who's like a scholar and a researcher at Oxford University. And William, Dr. Williams, he outlines three tiers of attention. Here's what he calls in the interview. He says there's like three layers in the attention. There's a spotlight layer that we're most familiar with. A spotlight layer is like the fleeting, targeted, like spotlight happens when you try to pray. You know what I'm saying? Like your, your mind just races everywhere. It's like a ping pong ball going everywhere. And it's like, it's targeted. It has a kind of everyday task to it. This is what you use when you're getting dressed, when you're watching TV, when you're mindlessly scrolling Instagram or TikTok. You're using spotlight attention. But then there's a second layer. It's called starlight attention. And this is the focus that you need to apply when you're wanting to deal with more longer term goals and desires. So you go to starlight. And then the third layer he calls daylight. And this is named, he ties it to the role of sunshine because sunshine allows people to see their surroundings more clearly. He says, thinking deeply about how you know what you want and why, that's the daylight layer. Now, church, we're in a moment now, culturally, where everything is pressing us to spotlight, when in reality, what we need is starlight and daylight to flourish as human beings. Like, we cannot become the kind of people God's called and created us to become by living just in spotlight. We need starlight and daylight. And Hari, in his book, goes on to quote two different studies to talk about kind of the magnitude of the issue facing us, they did a study with college students. And they wanted to find out how quickly college students switch tasks. How long do they stay focused on the one thing that they're focused on? You want to guess? 65 seconds. College student, the average college student today spends 65 seconds on one particular task. So college students, I've got about 30 more seconds to keep you right now. And you're moving on. <laughs> adults, we didn't fare much better. They studied adults in a working environment. You want to guess how long we stayed focused on one task? Three minutes. So I got about two minutes and 45 seconds with you to keep you hanging right here. Perhaps the motto for today could be, I tried to live, but I got distracted. I tried to live, but I got distracted. And Dr. Williams summarizes this way, if we want to do what matters in any domain, any context in life, we have to be able to give attention to the right things. If we can't do that, it's really hard to do anything. Now church, this is sobering. This has sobering implications for the level of complexity of things happening in our own nation and around the world. Just think about this for a minute. The level of complexity and the amount of daylight depth of focused attention and thinking that we need, especially leaders in the land to have today, it needs to go way beyond 65 seconds or three minutes. Are you with me? The ability to focus and think deeply on any subject, perhaps now needed now more than ever. And this is where we've come to the place in our storyline of Nehemiah. You see, Nehemiah has come to his play. I want to call this as Nehemiah's Hutchinson's Law moment. I put Hutchinson's Law in your notes. Some of you are quite familiar with this. Any occurrence requiring undivided attention will be accompanied by a compelling distraction. Some of you are like, that's every Tuesday for you, okay? But anything that requires a focused daylight level of attention is going to come with a compelling distraction to try to pull us away and get us just to be in spotlight realities. And this is where Nehemiah finds himself in Nehemiah 6. And just a quick recap I put in your notes, right? For those of you jumping in kind of in the middle of the series, we started in Nehemiah several weeks ago because we wanted to say, you know, Nehemiah, to understand Nehemiah, you have to understand exile. 
Because God's people, for 23 years prior to exile, Jeremiah had been bringing the word of God to the people of God. And the people of God responded to the word of God as stiff arm, spiritual heisman, push it away, we're not interested, we want to do our own thing, we want to do what we want to do, we want to do whatever we want to do in our own eyes, we're going to do what's right in our own eyes. And so for 23 years, Jeremiah was trying to bring the word of God to the people of God, and the people of God wanted nothing of the word of God. And so God said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uproot and displace you 700 miles over to the middle of Iraq. It's called the Babylonian exile in 586. So he allows the Babylonians to come in. They take 10,000 of them because people are, when they're uprooted and displaced, their hearts become more open to change, which parenthesis, this is how we can be praying right now for the circumstances in the Middle East. It's overwhelming to know how to pray into this. One of the ways we can pray into this space, the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that are uprooted and displaced, right now we can pray for an open door for the gospel in the heart. Because we know Jesus' people are serving all around you. You know that, right? Jesus' people are everywhere. And they're serving in his name. And they're carrying out his work. And we can pray for hearts to be open. That's what God was praying and hoping for for his people. I'm going to displace you. They're there for 70 years in Babylon. Nehemiah is born and raised in Babylon. He was cut bare to the king. He had a job to taste the wine and the food, make sure the king wasn't going to get killed by poisoning. And so he's a day laborer in the house, in the palace area, and God taps him on the shoulder and says, I've got something for you to do. It's time. Seven years have passed. I feel like the people's hearts are more open and receptive to returning, not just back to their homeland, but returning to the Lord. And so, Nehemiah, I need you to go back first, and I need you to rebuild the wall around the city. And so this is Nehemiah chapter 1. He begins to re- He starts praying and asking God for an open door. Remember, his praying went into five months of waiting. And the praying and went into waiting, eventually he's released to go, and he gets to examine the rubble. And the praying, the waiting, the examining eventually led to a rebuilding project. This is Nehemiah 1, 2, and 3. And he begins to get the teams together, and they begin to get after the work, and they build two miles around, 50 feet high, 10 to 15 feet thick. It's a massive project. And as we looked at recently, as they got about the project, they encountered resistance, because we've been talking about how resistance indicates progress. When you're pushing forward in the kingdom of God, when you're pushing forward for the purposes of Jesus, you're going to experience a push back. Or another way, when you're living out on the redemptive edge of what God's doing in this world, that's where the headwinds are strongest, out on the redemptive edge. And that's what Nehemiah's finding. He's at all kinds of things, pushing back on him, externally, internally. And now we've come to Nehemiah chapter 6, where he's encountering Hutchinson's law. It's like they're trying to distract him away from the purpose at hand. They're trying to create a compelling situation to pull him off the task. So chapter 6, verse 1. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem the Arab. Now, where have we seen these guys show up before? We've called them the trio of trouble in the book of Nehemiah, right? Sanballat, governor of Samaria, his name means sin has given birth. There you go. Thank you, mom, for that baby name book, right? (laughs) Tobiah's his assistant, and Geshem is the Arab overseeing a large territory in that part of the world. These three have come together, and they want to shut down the rebuilding of the wall. Why? Because they know a rebuilt wall means a strengthened people, which means more difficult to oppress and control. So they don't want the wall rebuilt. They want to shut it down. They want to keep the people under their thumb. And when they're kind of feeling defeated and discouraged and their stuff's in rubble, it's easier to control them. So they've been on the scene for several chapters now, and here they are back at it again. It says they come, and the rest of our enemies, that they had rebuilt the wall. So the, the wall, we covered it a couple of weeks ago. They completed the task in 52 days. Now, I know some of you are super productive. You have all kinds of things you're getting after in your work setting. I would just argue that's a pretty strong 52-day run. Would you agree? That's a strong Q3 for them. 52 days, two miles of wall, 50 feet high, 10 to 15 feet thick, with all the dynamics they had. They got it done. And Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem are now upset. They're upset that all this is going. Not a gap was left in it. Though up to that time, I had not set the doors and the gates. So they've got some gates to complete. They've got some more project to be done. Sambalot and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let's meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ano. Say Ano. Ano, it's a resort area 20 miles north of Jerusalem. So you see what's coming at 20 miles north of Jerusalem. Look at verse 3 now. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop when I leave it and go down to you? 
four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. So what we're going to look at in the text today, we're going to see three distractions that Nehemiah navigates. And the first distraction is what I'm calling the distraction of escape, not being where you're supposed to be. Ano represents the distraction of escape, of comfort, of recreation, of just chill. It's like, it's been long, it's been a hard month and a half, and I'm kind of wiped out. Remember, he was sleeping with his clothes on, he had a sword in one hand, he had a hammer in another. I mean, this has been a, an exhausting run. And they come at him and say, hey, why don't you take a little chill in Ano? Let's get some space in Ano. And this is, represents like when the pressures of life, when the pace of life, when the challenging circumstance of life, when they just... When they get on top of you and they just seem to be relentless, when it's just one challenging circumstance after another, you get to a place internally of mental, emotional, and physical weariness fatigue. For some of you, that's you this morning. That's where you're at. Like that's your, maybe this past month, maybe it's this whole year, maybe it's a sequence of years, and you just come and you just feel so depleted, you feel so fatigued, you feel so weary by the cumulative effect and then Hutchinson's Law kicks in. And Hutchinson's Law comes to you and it presents a compelling distraction. Let's go to Ano. Let's go to Ano. Do you hear it? Ano calls out to me with like just mindless scrolling. Like I can just mindlessly scroll through Instagram and I can jump from like NFL.com to USA Today to New York Times to Christianity Today. I can just scroll mindless headlines. And just t- hours just go by, just oh no. And it's usually right on the, like, a, I'm mentally, spiritually, physically, I'm just fatigued, I'm weary. And so Ano calls out, and Ano just, or another way Ano pulls at me is just kind of just binge watching Netflix or crack flicks, as I call it, right? I mean, how do they set it up where as soon as one episode ends, within 15 seconds, Without any credits, you're in the next episode. That's just like a, that should be illegal. <laughs> so good at it. And just stare mindlessly at screens. And, or Anno pulls at me, especially as it's getting darker and colder in the early morning hours when I know I need to be getting up and I need to get to the secret place, that quiet place of prayer and worship and scripture and the bed just feels so warm on us just roll over let's go back to sleep Ano, what's it for you we all got the place where Ano pulls. Where's the pull for escape? The distraction of escape. What's that look like for you when the pressures and pace of life get ratcheted up? What's your go-to? Where do you hear the phrase go to Ano? Where's that pulling at you? For some, it's a glass of wine that turns into glasses that turns into a bottle. For others, it's a tub of ice cream. For others, it's another Amazon order. For others, it's attention with that flirtatious coworker that you know does something to you, and you find yourself strategically spending more time in that setting. For others, it's clicking at all the sites that you know on the web you shouldn't be clicking at. What's the ano, the place of distraction? 2 Samuel 11, King David, the name of his ano was Bathsheba. You remember that scene in 2 Samuel 11? David's the king of Israel. There's a lot going on in the nation, a really intense time a lot going on in the king's palace, and he sends all the troops out to war, and he stays behind, not where he's supposed to be. And he sees a young lady named Bathsheba. He sees her bathing. His hormones are stirred. He's the king. He gets what he wants. I want her. Go get her. The assistant's like, hey, king, you know, she's married. I want her. Go get her. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. Didn't see that one coming. It wasn't quite in the... Wasn't thinking that one through. And he's like, oh, Uriah, her husband, he's out on the front line. He calls out his troops out there. He sends message out there. He set up a scene where Uriah gets wiped out by the enemy, like murders him on the battlefield, sets it up that way. So now Uriah's dead. Bathsheba's pregnant. David feels like he's got it all covered up. Oh, no. He just took, he did, oh, no. He thought he fooled everyone, but he didn't fool God. 
Church, think about all the stuff that happens in our life when we're not where we're supposed to be. And that's how Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem come at Nehemiah. They couldn't get him other ways. They're like, maybe we can just lure him away with an all-inclusive resort with a really nice view on the room. It's like, hey, have you heard about Anna? Have you heard? I mean, the view is amazing. It's all-inclusive. It's all you can eat. Like, Nehemiah, you've got to be tired. Why? Let's take a break. Let's go to Anna. Nehemiah sees right through it. Which is his maturity, right? So here's maturity in the midst of this distraction. He pushes back against Hutchinson's law. He's like, hey, I work when it's time to work and I rest when it's time to rest. That's maturity. You're where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's a sign of growing up. That's a sign of having well-grounded. It's like Nehemiah knows the project at hand is not complete. There's more work to be done, and I stay at it, I stay diligent, I stay on the task. There's a time and a place for recreation, yes, but it's not now. And so he sees right through it. Even in the midst of his perhaps fatigued and depleted state and notice how persistent they were lest you think like the call to Anno is just kind of a one and done have you noticed in your own life like I'm amazed how persistent just the call to escapist stuff is like four times they come at him and it says four times it gives them the same answer I'm not interested and now look at what happens in verse five the fifth time they're relentless Sanballat sent his aid to me and Nehemiah with the same message. And in his hand with a, was an unsealed letter in which was written. So now they're moving from the distraction of Anno, right, the place of escape. Now they're moving to distraction number two. It's a temptation. It's a temptation here. Look, it's reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true. Well, wait a minute. Well, that, that's super helpful. Yeah, Geshem's such a trusted character. Notice that? Well, if Geshem says it's true, that must be great. That you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us confer together. So do you see that from the distraction of escape and Anno to the distraction of intimidation now, saying, hey, we think you're going to be king, and we're going to send word to the king about this. And listen, you know something's up. Do you notice this, right? You know something's up in the report when there's no, when a source is rarely quoted. Do you see that? It is reported according to these reports. Anytime you hear that kind of, la- something's up. Or an atmosphere of exaggeration, plotting a revolt. It's like he's probably saying, dude, when have I had time to plot a revolt? I've been sleeping with my work clothes on. I've been busting my tail to build a wall. What have you been doing? You've been basically trying to thwart my project for 52 days. I got no time to plot a revolt and become their king. It's like, what, ca- what planet are you living on, Geshub, Sanballat, and Tobiah? And so that's why he responds. Look at verse 8. I sent them this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. Ha. How about leadership like that? We need some good leadership like that going on these days, right? We need some folks to step forward and say, you know, actually, that's not true. That's not reality. Remember, we've talked many times in here on Sunday morning, Real, Dallas Willard says, reality is what you run into when you're wrong. Somebody needs to say forward and say, that's unreality. That's called foolishness. That's not how you build your life. What you're saying is not true. That's what Nehemiah is like. You've made this up in your own head. You've concocted this story. You've got no sources for it. There's nothing about what you're saying is true, and you're not going to distract, trying to intimidate him. You see that? They went from trying to pull him off with distraction, and now they're going to pull him away for an escape. They're going to pull him away with intimidation. And so here's how this one, distraction number two, is losing sight of the real battle at hand. So if distraction number one is not, not being where you're supposed to be, distraction number two is losing sight of the real battle at hand. Here's how this Here's how this distraction works. You spend, try to get us to spend all our ener- energies on the sandbalots so we lose sight of the wall. That's this distraction. It's to take our focus off the real battle at hand and get us spending our energies on all these lesser battles. That's the distraction. I like what C.S. Lewis said in Screwtape Letters. If you haven't read Screwtape Letters, 
uh, outstanding read. It's Lewis. It's one of Lewis's kind of. It's a. It's an allegory. It's like a little bit of a parable where he writes a, a senior demon training a junior demon about how to thwart the purposes of Jesus in Christians' lives. And so the older demon is named Screwtape, and he's mentoring a younger demon named Wormwood. And in this section, I'm going to read to you. Screwtape is trying to convince his nephew how to understand the power of subtle distractions. You don't have to go like in their face at it. You can just go subtly. Listen to what he says. My dear Wormwood, it does not matter how small the sins are provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light, underline that, and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, with sudden turning, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts, your affectionate uncle, screw tape. Do you see that edging? I love that imagery of just edging us away from the light, just edging towards the dark, subtle, just kind of nudging us very subtly along, inch by inch. Man, I'm challenged by that. I don't want to spend my one and only life kind of edged away from the stuff that matters the most and kind of distracting my life away. And I feel like that's kind of the culture almost just like I just get kind of inch by inch increasingly distracted and not able to provide daylight focus on the stuff that matters most. I think that's some of the subtle or maybe not so subtle temptations happening right now to God's people. And Nehemiah, he understood. He saw right through this. He saw right through this temptation, like, hey, he's trying to just edge me along. He's just trying to, like, now he's trying to intimidate me along. He's trying to kind of muscle up on me here. He's trying to make it a a Nehemiah Sambalot battle. And Nehemiah sees through. He says, you know what? This isn't about Nehemiah versus Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem. He knows this. Nehemiah's like, it's really about Nehemiah's God, Yahweh, versus Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem's gods and goddesses and their pantheon. He's like that. And he says, I'll take that battle every day. My God's going to get the last word. I'm going to see right through it. And so he's like, what you're saying, you're just making up in your own head. I'm not going to waste my energy spending it here in these lesser battles. I'm going to complete this wall. I'm going to get these gates refurbished. We're going to get these people rebuilt. We're going to get this done. So he turns from, do you see that? He turns from the Sambalot, and he puts his energy to the real battle at hand. Man, there's a lot of wisdom there. And maybe some of you come in, and you're getting, you're getting, you're getting pinged on all kinds of fronts to expend energies on some lesser battles around you. Often they're human related. Often they have flesh and bone. And Paul reminds us in Ephesians six, hey, don't forget now, your primary battles aren't human. The primary battles are spiritual principalities and powers. So we need God. We need Nehemiah type wisdom. Nehemiah saw right through it. He's like, I'm not going to spend my energies here on the Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem drama. I'm going to get about the task at hand. I need some help with that. Because sometimes I can turn things human to human when really the issue needs to be this way. I can turn it horizontal when it needs to be vertical. And so that's, why, that's what Nehemiah does. Look, that's why he does this. Verse 9. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get weak, too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed. See, this is Nehemiah. I prayed. Now strengthen my hands. Basically saying, God, they're just running their mouth. They're just trying to distract us from getting this project done. They're just trying to intimidate us. But God, I know this. You've got all the power and resources to help me and strengthen me and enable me to complete what you want me to complete. And I wonder if that's a word for somebody here today. Maybe you come in and you feel kind of at the end of your own rope. And that's where I found God's address is at the end of your rope. And God wants you to know today he has all the power and resources to help you through whatever it is you're going through. You have to turn the battle from maybe human to human stuff and you start looking to him and let God strengthen the work of your hands and let God be your defender and let God get the last word. See, Nehemiah's not getting nudged away from the light. Do you see that? He's not getting edged away from the light. They're trying to yank him. Nope, I'm not, you got to get nudged away. This is someone who's navigating Hutchinson's law. He's seeing all the compelling distractions, and he's seeing right through them. So from the distraction of escape to the distraction of intimidation, now look at the third one, distraction of manipulation, verse 10. So they couldn't get him through Anno. <laughs> they couldn't get him through the letter, you know, saying, hey, you're going to become king, and you're plotting a revolt. 
So now they're twisting his arm. They're going to come at him through some friendships. Verse 10, one day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let's close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night, they're coming to kill you. Now listen, on the surface, this sounds like a very helpful invitation from a friend. They're coming to kill you. Why don't you come on over, get into the temple of God, we'll protect you. Here's distraction number three, using God to advance project self. This is distraction three here. See, Shemaiah, back, backdrop here, Shemaiah is a close friend of Nehemiah. He was such a close friend because he was a part of rebuilding the wall. He was probably a key leader with Nehemiah. He's the son of a priest, and he was a good laborer. He was a good worker, and he claimed to have some gifts of prophecy. So most likely, Nehemiah would have leaned on him, probably would have been in his little prayer circle. Probably Nehemiah had the prayer group as he was going through day by day. I'm sure Shemaiah was one of them. And so he comes to Nehemiah, and he says, hey, Nehemiah, they're coming for you. Take shelter in the temple, probably where they've hung out in some capacities before. But in this time, he's inviting them into an area of the temple that's reserved for the priests. And Nehemiah sees right through it, because he knows that if, he get, if they get him there, he's going to lose all credibility in trying to lead. So look at verse 12. I realize that God had not sent him, but he had prophesied against me, because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Look at those two guys, they're relentless. They're putting a vacation to Anno together, they're fabricating a letter about some revolt he's planning, and now they've bought off a friend. Hutchinson's Law. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. So you see, Shemaiah is using God to advance project self. Do you see that? He got paid off. Which is another parenthesis here, but if you've got a friend who can be bought off, may not be a friend. He bought off. And Nehemiah sees through all the religious noise and he recognizes this friend is just really trying to manipulate him. And he sees the difference, right? Here's the discernment. He sees the difference between God sending someone and Sanballat hiring someone. I want that kind of discernment. How about you? That's what you get. When you get to that quiet space, that secret place, that place where you can bow before the Lord, quiet and stillness to listen to God, to have the eyes of the Lord, you get that in the secret place when you're able to see that really wasn't someone that God sent, that was someone that Sambalot hired. Man, that's some discernment. That's what the Bible calls discernment, spiritual discernment, a wisdom that flows out of Nehemiah's life of prayer. We've seen this all through the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a prayerful man. Remember, he's not a priest, he's not a pastor, he's not a prophet. He's a day laborer, he's a worker, but man, he's a prayer. He gets to the secret place and gets before God. And then verse 14, I love how he cries out in honesty this way. Remember Tobiah and Sambalot, oh my God, because of what they've done. Remember also the prophetess, Nodiah, and the rest of the prophets who've been trying to intimidate me. It's like, whoa, there's like a little trio. There's like a tribe being formed here. Now we've got a prophetess. There's a whole batch of prophets involved with this. They're trying to turn. They, he probably would have hung out with this group, turned to them for counsel and support and guidance. And now he finds out they're all kind of collected together, they've probably all been bought off, and now they're all trying to undermine his leadership. And he knows that he sees through, he sees the manipulation and intimidations. In church, sometimes the biggest distractions to the work of God come from the people of God in the work. And man, that's, that's difficult. That's some tough stuff to navigate. Because Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem's, like when you, when you have that going on in your life, their motives seem to be pretty obvious when they're just kind of it's obvious they're opposing what you're standing for. Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem, they're a little bit easier to spot in our lives. I think the Shemaiahs and the Nodiahs are more complex to sift through. They're the people who used to like be alongside you in the work of God and have somehow gone to another place and are trying to pull you. They're trying to edge you away from the light now. You used to be companions in the light, and now they're trying to edge you away from the light. I think that's a lot more complex. Anybody else feeling that? That's a lot more complex to sort through. It's what David was praying through in Psalm 55. This is what David was dealing with, much like Nehemiah is dealing with here. He says, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. 
If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from him. But it's you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house of God. You see, church, some of the deepest experiences of pain and betrayal come from those who are closest to us. Some of you know that all too well in your households. But it's not just in your homes. It's also in the house of God. Sometimes closest relationships in the house of God can be the deepest experiences of hurt and betrayal you encounter. And this, Nehemiah, that's had to, can you imagine how tough this was for him? These are like friends. These weren't just like, it was like Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem. They were never friends. They weren't praying together. They weren't hanging out together. They weren't worshiping together. But he remembers Shehemiah. He remembers Nodiah. He remembers maybe 915 prayer gatherings with them. Maybe he remembers worship nights with them. Maybe he remembers going on a mission trip with them. There were small group meetings. He remembers. He's like, we used to go festive throng together. We used to have sweet fellowship together. And now, and for some of you, that's your story. And that's what brings you here. For some of you, you've got your own Shemaya experience. Like you had sweet fellowship with someone in the house of God, in the body of Christ. And for whatever reason, they walked away. And they walked away in such a way that they just left kind of a trail of hurt and betrayal and confusion. And you just, you're just left going, what's up with that? There's so much unresolved things relationally in this life, is there not? So much stuff goes kind of unsettled and unresolved. And I think Nehemiah has what I pray that we'd all have. He had this kind of perspective that, you know what? Maybe he's never going to get it sorted out with Shemaiah in this life, but here's what he rests in. He knows God's going to get the last word. And God's going to sort it all out. We just might not get to see it in this life, and that's what's so hard for us. But it didn't distract him. I could get pulled into distraction from this. I get, Jesus says, love your enemies. If you stick around church, you're going to find a few here. Love your enemies. You'll find a few at church. Just get involved in humanity. Just immerse yourself. And humans are humans. We just kind of mess things up. And things get messed up and then hurt and betrayal happen and all of a sudden it's like this. And you get pulled away. Do you see how Nehemiah could have been pulled away? But he saw right through it all. He says, you know, I've got a bigger task at hand. So Hutchinson's law. Any occurrence requiring undivided attention will be accompanied by a compelling distraction. In Nehemiah 6, the compelling distraction is, hey, I want to invite you to be somewhere that you're not supposed to be. Not being where you're supposed to be is a distraction. Come over to Ono. It's the place of escape. Or the, or the, the second distraction, right? Because when he, he goes from distraction of not being where you're supposed to be, then he comes to losing sight of the real battle at hand. He's like, they want to pull me in and make it just a Sambalot versus the Nehemiah thing. He's like, nope. I'm going to lift up my eyes to the mountains and see my help comes from the Lord. You see, this is Nehemiah's God versus Sambalot's God, and I'll take that battle in the arena every day. So he says, Lord, strengthen my hands. And then the third, third distraction that came at him, right? So he's losing sight, don't lose sight of the road, and there's this God, trying to use God as project self. So it's like this third distraction where Shemaiah says, you know, I'm going to build project self using God, using religious means to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. and Those are compelling distractions that Nehemiah had to have. This is Hutchinson's law, full court press on him. So worship team, come on back up. Here's how we're going to wrap up. I want to ask you two questions and leave you with a quote. Two questions. What's taking place in your life right now that needs undivided attention? What's going on right now in your life that you know you need some daylight layer attention? Spotlight's not going to cover it. You need daylight. You need more than three minutes of focus. What's going on there? What, what? And then secondly, what's the compelling distraction that's kind of relentlessly attempting to pull you away? It's important to name these things, I think. So I'd like you to spend some time this week doing that. Listen to what Johan Hari, the quote in the book, is what he says. The truth is that you and I are living in a system that is pouring acid on your attention every day. You want to read a book? 
but you're pulled away by the pings and paranoias of social media. You want to spend a few uninterrupted hours with your child, and you keep anxiously checking email to see if your boss is messaging you. You want to set up a business, but your life dissolves into a blur of Facebook posts that only make you feel envious and anxious. If this goes on, hear this, for months and years, it scrambles your ability to figure out who you are and what you want. You become lost in your own life. And maybe that's someone this morning. Maybe you stroll in here or someone watching online and the commentary is you feel lost in your own life. And the word from the Lord today is you got to do battle with Hutchinson's law. And Nehemiah is a really good guide. And so here's our spiritual practice for the week. I'm asking us all to give this a try. One minute at the beginning of the day. You can go ahead and get your phones out now if it helps you set your alarm right now. One minute at the beginning of the day where you stop and you get quiet and you get still and you get silent for one minute. That's it. Somewhere in the early part of the day, maybe right as you rise, maybe even before you put your feet on the floor, maybe you just lay there in the bed for a minute, take a few breaths, one minute, and in that minute you say, good morning, Lord. I commit this day to you. Or maybe it's after you. Maybe you need to get up. Maybe you need to get a little coffee in you or something. But you, somewhere early. Maybe it's as you, just before you start your commute. Maybe it's you're sitting in your car before you pull out of the driveway right there. Or maybe it's after you get the last kid out of the house and all the kiddos are out and the house is quiet as it's going to be right there. Somewhere in the early part of your day. One minute. Stillness. Silence quiet, whispering a prayer, good morning, Lord, I give this day to you. Church, could you imagine what might happen if several hundred of us just became a little more present to God and present to people in the midst of our day? Could you imagine? To help us navigate the compelling distractions that are going to come. To think that the distractions are going to get better. That's, no, it's who we become in the middle of them to navigate. And I want to be more like Nehemiah. I want to have the kind of wisdom and integrity and groundedness that he had. How about you? This is the invitation to get away to be still, to let the distractions settle and have the gift of presence. Let's pray together. Father, such challenging times, I just confess that there are days and weeks where I just feel like it's overwhelming to navigate the volume of distraction. And so I pray that you would help us, that you would help us as a people, Lord, as a church family. Lord, we want to we wanna be a people who are attentive and who are focused and who are given to give mental energy to the things that you say matter the most and not to get pulled away to escapist stuff or to the wrong battle or a bunch of hurt and betrayal or just get wound around all these things. Lift us up, strengthen us. I pray for those who come in today especially weary overwhelmed with life circumstances. May they join Nehemiah. Lord, strengthen the work of my hands. May you pour out a measure of strength and peace. Maybe some here feeling lost in their own life right now. And just today, would you just send a ray of light and hope in the midst of all the despair and confusion. Lord, would you show them a way through what they're going through. Give us the gift of the sacrament of the present moment. This week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to wrap up with one final song. As we do so, we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings. Details are up here on the screen. And then there's some boxes in the back at the tables. Those of you online, your host will direct you accordingly. Just a couple words about, you know, we do our offering at the end of the service. It's a part of our worship. Like, this isn't just an add-on. Like, it's central to when God's people gather, they offer their gifts, just like we offer our songs and we offer our attention to the scriptures. We offer our prayers. We offer our gifts as an act of worship. And that's what this portion is. If you're a guest with us, you don't need to feel any obligation, but this is our time to worship him with the physical possessions that he's given us. To say, God, you 
you are the one that owns my heart. Money does not own me. My job does not define me. The things of this world, they don't. You alone are Lord of my heart. And giving helps us do just that. So this is our act of worship. So during this song, we're going to receive that. And if you need prayer, our prayer benches are open up here. You come up here. Be folks to pray with you. Let's stand together. Worship team's going to lead us.
I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Put your hands together. You believe that? <laughs> Have a seat. And we want you to feel all you're always welcome to come and kneel and pray here anytime. Worship and pray. This is sacred space always. So we have a few announcements to give you and then a benediction. So we've got a mission. We've got two mission trips coming up in the spring. Want to get these dates out. These are kind of save the date announcements. We've got a mission trip in March going to Sicily, Italy. Tom Langebartles is leading that trip, working with North African refugees. Okay, so see Tom, go online, get some more info there. There's going to be a meeting coming up on November the 4th. November the 4th is a meeting for that. And Bosnia, Bosnia trip is occurring in April, and it's going to be a work trip led by Mike Steffi, helping Petula Myers, dealing with some of the camp. There's a camp that they use for a lot of ministry, and they need some physical work done at the camp. And so if you're lending itself to more physical work, Bosnia trip, if you want to be involved in more like evangelism, discipleship kind of work, you can do the Sicily trip, but both great opportunities, love to have you go and participate, get more info online, come to the information meeting on uh, November the 4th. Student ministry, high school students, cool thing happening tonight. So there's a group of youth groups, several churches have gotten together and they're hosting a joint youth worship rally with high schoolers tonight at New Hope. Isn't that cool? So tonight, 7 o'clock tonight, students, you're meeting here at 6, you're going to have some pizza together, and then you're literally walking across the street, and the worship rally is going to happen over there at New Hope. It's like, I think, ZPC and ZF and Eagle and New Hope and maybe a couple others. So be praying for that, church. Cool. Students, I'm super pumped for what God's going to do with that. And then middle school students, this is your last day to sign up for the lock-in. Yeah, and Audrey's excited. We got over 50 middle school students. Do we have 50? 55 middle school students locked in for the night. That has to be an act of God. That's all I'm saying right there. So all the details are online. Sign up. Parents, it's your last day to get signed up, so get the kiddos there. And then ladies, you've got a worship night this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Ladies here, 7 to 8.30 up in the loft. Hunter and Jen Smith leading worship, going to be a great night. Kim's going to be leading, kind of provide a little vision, direction, where we are as a women's ministry, what's coming ahead. So ladies, you're looking for a place to connect, come worship and pray, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. And lastly, this coming Saturday, we've got our annual trunk or treat going on. So this is going to be a great, it's kind of harvest party, we're going to have hay rides, we're going to have some pumpkin painting, we're going to have some apple cider and donuts, and I don't know all the stuff we're going to be doing, but we're also going to have a bunch of trunks decorated and give out a bunch of candy, and this idea is we'd love for you to come, we could use some more trunks, so if you go online you could sign up to be a trunk, and then you could bring some candy in if you want to, you want to donate some candy that way, or we're just going to go out and buy a bunch of candy. And then we're praying that a lot of the folks in the community come. This is a great, last year we probably had 800 plus kids come through. And so bring your kids, kids bring your friends, parents bring your friends, four to six next Saturday. Weather forecast looks pretty good. It's like I think low 70s and cloudy right now for next Saturday. So that would be golden for this time of the year if that happened, right? We're going to do it out here kind of on the north side of the building. We're going to set up an area. We'll have a, a good time together. So four to six next Saturday, come on out and be with us. And if you're new here, we're super glad that you're here. You can pick up a gift on the way out at Guest Central. There's a gift bag. They'll give you some free stuff uh, on your way out. Let's stand together. I'm going to send you out with a benediction. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So I'd like you to go today with the blessing of Jesus on the eyes of your soul to enable you to look at what you can't see and that your ability to see into the unseen will frame what is seen. So invisible reality will frame and shape your visible reality. And in that, you will go as a people of Jesus, attentive to God. Go in his name. Amen.